Today's show is sponsored by Audible, and today's novel, Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card, is available through audible.com's audiobook library. A novel podcast listeners can get a free trial and a free download of any audiobook by going to audibletrial.com slash a novel podcast. You're listening to a novel podcast, in-depth discussions of literature from all genres and generations. Today we're discussing Ender's Game, a 1985 military sci-fi novel by American author Orson Scott Card. Joined with me today is my wife Sarah and our good friends Warren, Nick, Andrew, Samantha, and Ian. My name is Russell and I'd like to go ahead and get us started simply by uh, discussing my how I kind of discovered this book. It was kind of a funny story where my father was driving to Florida with a friend of his, and the friend insisted on reading an audiobook on the ride down there, the second in the series. And so my father gets back and says it was awesome, but he didn't understand any of it. And I thought, well, if he liked it, but he didn't understand it, I'm sure it's good. So I'm going to give it a listen. And was utterly blown away. If I could ask uh, um, maybe Nick, how did you first come to discover this story? Um, I actually discovered it from watching the movie first, which is normally frowned upon, but it was good enough in the movie that I decided to listen to the book, and now I have a hard time watching the movie. Was that the 2013 movie? Yes. The, yep. rec- the recent movie? I'm pretty sure that was the only movie adaptation. Yeah, it is the only movie adaptation. Card, before this one came out, because well, it was since it was written back in the 80s, when Card um, was approached the first few times to do a movie, he felt like technology and the director's vision wasn't really matching up with what he had in mind in the book. So it's only actually until recently that we've gotten so involved with CGI and stuff like that that made Card's vision possible. So he actually did approve the 2013 movie, but he had been approached several times before that to to do several. Right. He specifically mentioned the battle school room. So the, Mm -hmm. the battle room itself and like the fact that the CGI just wasn't up to date so he was waiting out for it It yeah really interesting you really had a vision in mind it sounds like yeah and this the special effects were finally on point and but then what the hell did they do to petra's character oh my goodness that was probably one of the worst things they could have done to a character in a very long time almost as bad as ron weasley's adaptation Mm. (laughs) well see the whole time he didn't make the movie because they were afraid or orson scott car was afraid that uh they would try to make uh, Ender and Petra have a love interest mm. and they were always trying to cast the characters as being old enough to make that appropriate. <laughs> That's why it didn't come out for a long time and then they kind of like subtly did it in the movie. So, so they got around it They got around it by making Petra a doe-eyed little flower that just bats her eyelashes at Ender constantly. Yeah. 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 Did anybody else listen to this on audio? Never. I, no, I, I have it. not. Nope. Okay. In the end of the audiobook, there's a really cool interview with Orson Scott Card where he talks in mm-hmm. great detail about the travels and the trials and tribulations of making this into a movie and how very specific he was about exactly all those demands. Yeah, that's what I was referring to. Mm-hmm. I might have to check that out. Yeah, it was quite good. Now, the story in general, I'd like to talk a little bit about the story, and I'm going to start by asking without asking actually for an answer, but I'm going to pose this question to everybody. What is the theme of this book? And so I'd like us to discuss the story a little bit and then come back to that question. So ultimately the story is about uh, Ender Wigan, who is uh, chosen from a family very specifically to become the ultimate battle commander to save, basically save the human race from an alien invasion that everyone believes is coming. Uh, and he's put through incredible rigors through battle school. Now, what did you all think in particular as he's moving off to battle school of uh, you know his reactions and him being chosen? Yeah, so I, I'll probably start off with the fact that once they remove the device and he kind of experiences the depression that's associated or commonly associated with uh, the other intelligent young individuals who don't get selected for going up to battle school, I think that kind of just like highlighted the perspective of Ender from the beginning. And I thought Orson Scott Card kind of did a really good job of staying with that same mindset throughout as of like, there's this kind of higher power that's controlling Ender, yet he has no way of really knowing that that's there. And so at that, at that point, it was like the, like 
Colonel Graff and the other um, higher ups at the IF watching him and everything along those lines. And so it's kind of like the thematic point that Ender doesn't really have full control of the entire situation, his lack of awareness of that control and the constant feeling of alone. And we see that later, later on when he teams up with Rackham as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think uh, some of the uh, comments that uh, Graff makes uh, to Ender's and his parents about um, how the government kind of consigned his birth in the first place and allowed him to be born a third. And uh, they kind of owned him from the get-go on how his parents and Ender kind of didn't really have a choice, um, even though Graf, uh is of the mindset that it's not going to happen if Ender doesn't want to go or doesn't feel the need to go. But uh, that's an interesting concept to me is that, you know, the main character is kind of just allowed to be because of the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, his I mean, whole existence is centered around them needing that particular, those particular characteristics that Ender wound up possessing. It was almost like trial and error with the first two kids. It's like these first two kids, children of the Wiggins, who are these brilliant people and have so much going for them. They've denounced their religion. These guys look like the likeliest candidates to produce our, you know, battle school candidate. It seemed almost like these two, Valentine and, and Peter before him, were those exper experiments for the ultimate culmination of it which was ender and they you know just like the the last person said they certainly owned him from the very beginning they gave the implication of a choice to go to battle school but they certainly framed that choice so that way ender really didn't have one his only option was to go they made it very clear to him that he wasn't needed or wanted on earth based on his birth and his place and in, in society well the interesting thing is that he uh he knows he's a third. He's been like ridiculed for it his entire life and had all the hardships of that. So he he knows that he was requisitioned and allowed to be born for the reason that he's taken. And I think that's part of the reason why when he is given the like quote unquote choice, he ends up going anyway. It yeah. would have been interesting if he was a, like the second or first born or something, if he still would have made that choice. It's almost like it was the choice was made for him just because of the conditions of his birth. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really think that's what helps him connect with Bean so much, too. It's like that outcast mentality. They're able to be smaller than everybody else for the first part, but the second part, they're also far more intelligent of all of these intelligent children. So it was interesting how the isolation kind of leads those two to connect on this interesting level. I thought it was interesting... It almost seems as if um, he was bred to do this. And for part of the novel, I was thinking, well, it's strange that they didn't give him any early instruction and really insert themselves into his early schooling. And then I sort of thought about it for a moment and he was entered into battle school at the age of six or seven, mm -hmm. which is six. Right. Pretty early. <laughs> and, uh, that's all right. That's pretty early to start this. Hey, the future of all mankind hinges upon you. No pressure, six-year-old. <laughs> oh, you wipe I'm... yourself. <laughs> Finish your apple juice and let's go. Right. right. Got some genocide to do today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking now of a quote that I, I jotted down from Graf. And he says, As far as the rest of the universe is concerned, we could be wiped out and it would adjust. But humanity doesn't want to die. We want to survive. And the way we do that is by straining and straining. And every few generations, we give birth to genius. Now, the question I have is, do you feel like that's really the way Graf feels? Or do you feel like Graf just knows that's what he needs to say in order to get Ender to do what he wants to do? Every, everything Graf does throughout the entire story is precisely calculated to get the exact reaction he wants out of Ender. I definitely agree with that. Graf's a soldier through and through. <clears throat> Is he is a person who is going to execute the orders that he was given regardless of, you know, he's one of those the means justify, you know, the end justify the means type people. He was ready to, I don't think he believed that. I believe he was ready to say anything he needed to say to get Ender into battle school, groomed and into command school. Yeah, and you, you get that kind of in the, in the beginning of the chapters, the little snippets of conversation between uh, Graf and Admiral Chamrajnagar, where he straight up says, you know, we're, we're going to do this however it needs to be done, then they can court-martial us later. Mm. Yeah. True. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's and you, you juxtapose that against the fact that he ends up being like kind of buddy-buddy to Ender in the beginning and then ostracizes him as soon as he gets on the space uh, 
flight up to the battle school, which is interesting because obviously, like, we're seeing this contradictory viewpoint from the initial interconnected speech that he has in the beginning of the chapter and then seeing it completely change when he actually engages with Ender. He definitely flipped the script on him the instant he was given the opportunity to execute the plan that he had in mind. Suck Ender in, make him want to go. Now it's time to harden him up and get him ready for the battle. It, it, it really showed the minute that they got onto that flight to go away with all the other kids, you know, for the first time. But I mean, to play devil's advocate, don't you think he might have actually believed that Ender was the chosen one from two or three generations? And at one point in time, Graf does say very specifically, he says to someone other, like one of the other commanders, I'm not sure which one it was, but he says, Ender Wigan is 10 times stronger and smarter than I am. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it was Anderson he was talking to because Anderson was kind of getting on him about not letting up ever on Ender across the years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Anderson was trying to kind of ease the pressure a little bit and Graf was like, not going to happen. This is the way that we produce the commander that we need. So do you feel like that was Graf just doing more manipulation? Graf is always manipulating. And like, he's, he's a soldier, but he's only a soldier to get to where he needs to go, which is saving all of humanity and like, Later on in the book, he becomes the uh, colonization person, and like that's always his goal. So he just knows he has to do whatever he has to do to whoever to get the job done and to save humanity. I think he truly did believe Ender was the chosen one, but he did what had he, what he had to do to get there. I think he believed that because. Like we just talked about a minute ago, the government did commission Ender's birth. They did commission it based on the research they did on the first two kids. And Graf, like I mentioned a minute ago, he's he's a soldier. He's a government man. I think he he believed that Ender was the chosen one and he did what he needed to do or or what he felt like he needed to do to get, you know, the final result, which was successful. But it was it was definitely brutal on a child. (laughs) Right. Right. We really see that, too, when he's describing the way that Ender strikes Stilton after they take away his device, like after he gets in that fight at school very early on. I mean, it it just shows when Graf's describing how Ender was so calculated, his his initial confidence in him from the beginning. I think that just stayed with him throughout. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you you see this this character who was born, commissioned, created by the government, essentially— uh, to serve a purpose, and he's kind of being put through the ringer while he's got a monitor on. He's uh, being put through the ringer when he goes into battle school. Battle school just gets harder and harder and harder as he goes along. And, and leading up into when he finally does get out of battle school, what other thoughts do you guys have about him going through those trials and tribulations and, and dealing with Bonzo and um, dealing with the, the very difficult uh, battles that are that are handed him once he finally does get his commission as an officer of a dragon army and how does that take him how does that take him into eventually when he does that final battle in battle school and leading him out of that yeah so i think it's a little uh interesting um you know he's supposed to go through all this stuff uh, early on in battle school by himself and not to rely on anybody and not to have any help um when that's kind of exactly what happens uh toward the end of the book when he you know kind of starts crashing and everybody else is doing the same thing yeah, I don't know. It's kind of weird how they endangered their best shot so many times um, to make sure that he didn't get any help, just to have him learn that he needs to work as a team, you know, at the end of the book. <laughs> does seem like a risky strategy, right? <laughs> yeah. It almost seems like it was, a, it, some of them were calculated risks, and then it almost seems like some of them, it was Graf kind of making his own decisions which is i think you know part of why they held him accountable and court-martialed him later on i think a lot of it had to do you know with with a lot of a of control went into graf's hands um because he was had such an intimate relationship with ender he was with him from start to finish you know i think a lot of control went into his hands and and you know like like with you know like i said he was held accountable a little bit later on based on what it is that he did i think that a lot of it was trial and error. I don't think a lot of what Ender went through was really commissioned from higher ups. I don't think that that was the plan to groom a soldier. I think that that just became the plan as as they were going along. Do you think that Graf ever had anyone under his wing specifically as he had Ender prior to this event? Or do you think that that stress that was put on Ender comes from the fact that the deployed fleet was getting closer and closer to the bugger home world? I really think that stress 
became uh, when when the fleet came along. I don't know if they really were sure that Ender was the chosen one, but because they chose him, he became the chosen one. That fleet is on the way. They need to get to it and make make a commander that's going to fix this. Yeah, I think Graf well, even alludes to that at some point later in the book. Well, yeah, I think Vazar yeah. Rackham said something to him when they were like initially started the individual one on one training. He's like, there were there were many before you, and there will be many after you, or something along those lines. But he indicates to Ender that he's not unique; he's not the chosen one. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think uh, Mazer actually um, a little bit of spoiler about some of the original books um, also has a very young, um, very intelligent kid help him, uh, you know, achieve his victories. Right, um, right. that you don't really know about in the Ender's Game book, but um, you know, I think there's something to be said there because Mazer is able to talk to Battle School and is able to talk to Graf. Um, so I think a lot of it does stem from that conversation that we don't really hear, but something you could imply um, that those two had quite a bit of communication and chats about what it would take to uh, find someone that's going to be able to beat the buggers. Well, kind of a spoiler for... Uh... What is it? One of the, one of his books, like Gifts of War, which is like a pre the Christmas kinda, special. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like pre sequels oh, uh, to a uh, war Andrew's of game. A War of Gifts. A yeah, war? that one. He. Uh, I didn't realize that was a novel. I thought that was an unrelated book because I know he did ad- other books. I didn't realize that had to do anything with the Underworld. Yeah, it takes place it's, at Battle School. Enderverse. Okay, that's no, one I have takes, to check out. Uh, maybe it's a different one. Maybe it's not War of Gifts, but it's a book that basically goes into uh, John Paul, uh, Ender's dad, and um, Teresa, and it actually basically shows that the IF pushed events in such a way that they made these two highly intelligent people uh, make these intelligent children. So I think they knew even then that they were going to make some smart child. And then since the fleet was coming to its deadline so close and they couldn't requisition like a fourth, if Ender hadn't worked out, they just kind of had to make Ender work. But Ender did have the qualities they were looking for. He was like half Peter, half Valentine kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think, I, I think they knew that that particular uh, cadre of trainees was going to be the end all be all because in the shadow series ender's shadow specifically they even have the fail safe of Bean being able to take over overall the overall command of the war if ender, if ender falls apart drops out yeah i forgot all about that that's right because it didn't ender's shadow take place alongside ender's game but it was from yeah. Bean, right from right. Bean's point of view, right? Yeah, and if you were to read that one, um, there is quite a bit that he do- Bean does do um, for that final assault that uh, Ender doesn't really know about. And for the Dragon right. Scroll, like yeah. he puts together his entire army. Of- yeah, Bean handpicks all of Dragon Army. Yeah, right. that too. Which, uh, which also so they, made- set it, they set it up to try and succeed either way, with or without Ender. They were going to have a chosen one, and they were going to start bringing the war to the Formic. That yeah, that's something. Yeah, I think it was the proximity of the fleet that kind of necessitated that it be one of them, whether it was Ender or Bean or Ally. Right. Mm-hmm. As long as you have some kind of backup, I mean, of course, it's like they're going to want somebody to have a backup. And it just so happened that Bean was almost smarter than Ender and was head mm-hmm. there at the same time. Right. And what was, what, was, what was interesting to me was when he actually does make the final decision to dive in towards the bugger world and fire the doctor device at the planet. Interestingly enough, even though all these backups were around him, they never did anything to stop him in through that plan, even though it must have seen from an outside perspective kind of suicidal at that point. Hmm. You could argue that being kind of like put like pushed the rock that went down the hill because he uh, said like the enemy's gate is down when Ender froze. So in a way it was kind of, and Ender even credits him later as saying that something along the lines that Bean, without Bean, he wouldn't have known what to do. Hmm. Mm-hmm. He broke, Bean broke right. the ice with that little comment and, and yeah. he was, you know, he was Ender's right hand man, whether Ender mm-hmm. liked it, accepted it or knew it or not. Yeah, and they had given yeah. Bean the opportunity to take command right at that point, but instead he decided to try and shock Ender back to, uh, into action. Mm-hmm. Now, you do see, after that final battle at Battle School, you do see Ender kind of break down. Uh, 
he decides he doesn't want to deal, deal with it anymore. Why play this fight if it's if we're not going to fight fair? Now, how how did you guys feel? A, you know, did Graf see this coming? Did he have a contingency plan? Was he, uh, you know, drawing his last card when he, he pulled Valentine out? And, and as he moves into eventually command school, uh, do you think that Graf was kind of worried that maybe he'd made a bad decision? Maybe it wasn't going to work? What did you guys think of that? I do. I think Graf was worried he was going to make bad. I think he knew that at some point he was going to be held accountable for everything that Ender did. And if, if that was going to happen, then along the way he needed to make sure Ender was successful because, you know, like we talked about still so fully and Bonzo, the, you know, the whole fight in the, in the bathroom, you know, Graf was going to be a held, ac- held accountable for these young boys' lives. And he would have been, he escaped his punishment much better because of the success of, mm-hmm. of what happened. You know, it ended up working out just fine. But if it wouldn't have worked out just fine, he would have been in some serious trouble. He wouldn't have been the minister of colonization. He would have been, you know, court-martialed and... That, that guy in the cell. Thrown into that military guy. prison instead. Yeah. yeah, so he needed to pull out all them stops. He needed to do what he had to do to make sure that his plan got executed because he was in trouble in hot water for a lot of other stuff. I mean, they kind of went through, um, in battle school, you know, you saw Ender uh, develop and get challenged and then eventually break down and kind of just say, screw it, I'm just going to go for it. And he does kind of the same thing um, at the end of the book. And in both cases, he just kind of assumes that it's a game, uh, yeah. is told it's a game and doesn't know that, you know, doesn't have the knowledge that it's real people that he was, you know, just throwing at a whim and saying, whatever, I'm done. You know, they can have me or they can't. Um, so right. I think Graf had to have known that that was something that, that could have happened. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's really it's very interesting, um, you know, that he didn't tell him that they were real people at some point during, you know, before that final, final assault. You know, that much I can understand. The one thing I can't quite fathom, though, is why they didn't simply say your objective is the planet in that final battle. To to tell him this is just your test and and we're just still just simulating, I understand completely. But why is it that they didn't simply make the planet the objective? Because they don't. nobody wanted to be responsible for wiping out an entire huge race of the only intelligent life we've come along in the entire universe. That's why they gave that responsibility. Mm. To yeah, them. Uh, Ender. I don't Ender think even, they knew it at that point, though. Mm-hmm. Ender even brings that up before the final battle at Command School uh, when they tell him this test is different because it's based around the enemy's hypothetical home planet. He mm-hmm. asks something along the lines of, "Well, what if I fire on the planet?" And Graf says, "Now look, in none of these wars have either side attacked you know one of each other's home planets. Do you really want to, you know?" knock that snowball down the hill. Mm-hmm. But they appear knowing that he would be the type of person to ask that question. They put under there under that pressure knowing that he'd be the type of commander to do an all or nothing. Exactly. Which is exactly what they saw in him when he attacked Stilson and again justified when he saw uh, attack Bonzo, knowing that I- I've got to end this battle now. This war can't continue on. If I don't win the first battle, I will lose the war. Yeah, if I don't win exactly. all, if I don't win this first one, then I lose the rest of them. He says yeah. well, that the before, uh, so he was defending himself against those two, but uh, yeah. I think if he was the one going out and attacking people, that uh, would have been more Peter esque. Yeah, yeah that, it would have been that, definitely right. Peter esque to, to stage an attack. I mean that that was that was kind of why it was Ender why they didn't take Peter is Peter was malicious in nature. Ender just did what needed to be done. Mm-hmm. Very pragmatic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So to ask a question that's going to bring us back to the first question I asked, what the what is the theme of this book? What would have happened if either they had lost that final battle, or what would have happened if the IF had never staged the third invasion at all? Rather, they had simply prepared their defenses for a third bugger invasion. The Hive Queen kind of goes into detail about that at the end of Ender's Game, that mm-hmm. she says, we didn't realize you were intelligent beings when we attacked you. Right. You know, they, I, there wouldn't have been a third invasion if humanity hadn't been the third invasion. That's right. Hum- humanity was the third invasion. There were only two formic invasions, and then humanity took the war to, mm-hmm. to their turf. But, yeah, yeah the Queen yeah. did say there wouldn't the- have been another conflict. We realized after... 
you know, our, we realized our mistake after it was too late, but we did realize our mistake and there would not have been. Yeah, and, and, mm-hmm. Ender even supposes that, you know, they, they have all the propaganda footage about the Marines getting slaughtered and to try and stir mm-hmm. up, you know, the public outcry. But Ender even posits, you know, if this is a hive society, then killing a handful of people, if they think we operate the same way they do, that's like trimming your fingernails right. to them. Right. Mm-hmm. Here, we're, right. They weren't. They didn't think of us as as intelligent beings individually because they were not intelligent beings individually. Right. I was going to say the Earth trilogy, the most recent one that he wrote in that Orson Scott wrote with uh, Aaron Johnson. They were talking about how they give a lot of insight into the buggers kind of landing on the planet, and because they're referring to the first, like, and second formic wars, and in that sense, that it just completely shows that they have no understanding of the human species at all. And so, and they, he really goes in depth to describe how they're terraforming the planet, erasing all life and kind of treating humans as if they were just the same as blades of grass. And so just kind of like harping on that initial point. A spoiler, I guess for the xenocide is the reason why in Ender's game that he was getting all the dreams um, about, the buggers like vivisecting him and stuff is because they were actually trying to get into his mind and in the only way that they know how possible to communicate with him so i think there's like a slight possibility if the war if the invasion had failed or the uh or they hadn't done it at all that they possibly could have tried and communicated through ender uh and made like a, a pact or something but it never happened because of the events. Yeah, then they had the intention of trying to communicate with him through the game and, and a bunch of other ways. So, I mean, they kind of have an idea of what could have been, but, you know, with human human intervention. Yeah, so I guess I mean, uh, that kind of speaks to the theme and maybe getting to answer the question a little is, um, you know, when there are those communication barriers, when there's no way that you can, uh, you know, show the true compassion or true understanding um, of a stranger that you naturally become enemies and um, unless you can find a way to communicate or kill each other, you know, it's going to be the same thing over and over again. Uh, Graf even says that in the book, he says something along the lines of, uh, if you can't communicate with the other man, how can you be sure he's not trying to kill you? And you yeah. don't know he's not your enemy until he can tell you. Mm-hmm. Let's go back now. And we mentioned very early on that, you know, Ender was a, uh, commissioned based on uh, what came before him in Peter and Valentine. Uh, you see Peter very early on saying, is he's just teasing his siblings uh, rather maliciously, but still he says, I can make you guys believe anything. I can make you dance around like puppets. And I find that, you know, he eventually becomes this master of flattery. Uh, he's still very cruel. And now he's uh, being, as he, he grows older, he becomes cruel in, in many different, different, stronger ways. But ultimately what he comes to say much later on is, the power to cause pain is the only power that matters, the power to kill and destroy, because if you can't kill, then you're always subject to those who can, and nothing and no one will ever save you. So you see him growing, and him and his sister, even though they weren't chosen as the chosen ones to lead the fleet, still become extremely important. How did you guys see that developing and, and, and leading towards the end of the book? Yeah, uh, so it was a little something, you know, re- rereading the books, um, I wish they would have spent more time on, but... Um, some of the Shadow series does deal with that. Um, and some of the rest of the Ender's Game series does deal with that a little mm-hmm. bit as well. I think uh, what you really see is um, a weird switching of roles when you know Ender unknowingly uh, commits the genocide. Um, but then you also see uh, Peter's actions um, as a true act of compassion by trying to get Ender to not come back um, because he knows what people are and how people are and how the world was going to be. And uh, he knew that it was only going to be danger and fear and possibly death for his brother if he did make it back to Earth. Um, so I think that was a really interesting point for me. In the other uh, books, they show how it, it was actually like more Valentine that influenced Peter to write that and make him not come home. Right. So it wasn't entirely up to him. And Valentine's influence was pretty heavy, even though she was being manipulated by Peter Valentine's influence in those events were, were pretty strong in the way that she wrote, you know, her options for Peter. And she also wrote Ender off of, off of earth, you know, she definitely had that. And 
I, I kind of see how that, that was a necessity. And it, it's interesting because it's because of Ender that he had to go into exile because right after the Formic War ended, he was, you know, the most beloved human being in existence. You know, everybody loved him. He was the savior. But then he kind of outed himself by writing the Hive Queen that showed the true evils of what he did. So in a, in a way, it's kind of a self-imposed exile. Definitely. He, Definitely. Right. Which kind of further solidifies that isolationist perspective that he was at least was prescribed on him from very early on, which is interesting. Like everything we've talked about in terms of keeping him, making him the third, keeping him away from all the other battle school students, everything along those lines is kind of just like the same thing repeating itself where he has to ostracize himself from the human race again and again. Just to keep saving it over and over. He has to not be a part of it. He has to be a, a, a partner, a bystander and a, an observer of the human race, but never really a participant in order to keep it safe. And then after, like, studying the the Formix for so long in the war, he starts to less uh, connect with people in a way and more think of himself in uh, being related to them or, like, later on in the books, kind of being more of a, like, ramen instead of a human being. <laughs> Well, he becomes the speaker for the dead later on. He entirely sheds the mantle of Ender and Andrew and human, becomes the speaker for the dead. He gives himself that title. He takes away his own participation in humanity when he writes that story. He, you know, he he's fulfilling that role of not human anymore. Yes, he's human, but not part of not part of the fabric of the world, not part of the fabric of the human race anymore. He's chosen to be the speaker for the dead, and he's chosen to tell the story in a way that he's no longer the hero. You also see Ender, the first time that he gets up and he, he leaves Earth, right, right as he's on his way out to battle school, he realizes as he's looking at Earth, he sees it not as home, not as his own planet, but rather as a planet, not unlike all the rest. So the significance there, he's, he's already isolating himself from humanity in that regard. Do you guys see any other... Um, evidence of this through the book i think when he refers to himself even as a third he's not calling himself a person mm -hmm. i think when he's i think that that kind of not necessarily was bred into him but it was definitely conditioned to him from an early age that you don't belong here you're not part of of the rest of us you're a third so i think you know kind of what you just said a minute ago kind of you know, kind of brought that to my mind is that he wasn't ever really part of of things to begin with. He's always been a third. The planet's always been Earth and not home. And later on, you know, he's not the hero. He's the he's the guy who did this for everybody. Mm -hmm. I think that's a little bit of what kind of allows him to uh, ascend to what he needed to be, though. I mean, if you've got, you know, if no one wants you to join him, then you either, um, you know, be beneath them or you rise above them. And uh, in Agreed. this case, he was able to to take that animosity or that spite or that, um, you know, I guess I don't know what, if there's a better way than those two, but uh, use it to his advantage. Uh, you know, okay, well, they don't want me, but they have me mm -hmm. and I'm smart enough to know that, you know, I'm the one they need and the race needs me. So, you know, it feels a little bit of an ego there, I think, which um, you don't see explicitly, but it's definitely... Uh, motivating factor for him. There's a good bit of defiance behind Ender uh, throughout the entire book. He's he's always saying, "Well, if you guys aren't going to play fair, well, that's fine. I'll I'll win anyway." And you see that when he, what he does with Dragon Army. Yeah, he he likes to win out of spite, uh, which I admire. I guess he's got that underdog mentality. Yeah, and even after he actually does win that final, what he thinks is a simulation, but was actually the last battle, he even says in the end, "Why is it that everybody's acting as if what I did was with honor?" He's getting praise from everybody who's around him, and, and he can't stand it. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I kind of like, and that point in itself kind of is what separates him from Peter in the sense that he's more of like has a realistic perspective or at least an emotional perspective of what is right and wrong. And I think that Peter kind of lacks that, at least as a kid, before he grows up and finds the free people of Earth and everything along those lines. And so, interestingly enough, it's like Ender ends up being the third 
rightfully so because he's taking kind of a combination of Peter and Valentine and kind of having that good and that bad, that balance. But at the same time, he's not a full sociopath. <laughs> and so he's able to kind of rationalize what he is doing at the time and being like, hey, this is wrong. This is not right. Like, why is everybody praising me for this? All right. So I think thorough discussion of the story and everything that we've noticed about it. Let me let me bring it back now. What is the theme of this book? I struggled with that. I've read Ender's Game many times, and I've actually asked myself that question is, what is this book really about? It's not really about a little kid who goes away to school and saves the world. Mm -hmm. And it's not really about military strategy. It's not it's um, I guess I'm saying all the things that it's not about without saying what it is about. It's it's really tough to pin that down because there's so many elements. But the one thing, and I don't think this is at all what Card was trying to say, but the one theme that I got is, do the ends justify the means? Yeah. I, I got the impression that it's it's very nebulous. You can get out of it whatever you want to either put into it or whatever you feel you can pull out of it. I'm reading it, and, and I'm wondering halfway through, are the buggers even real? Are they just a, a fictitious creation by the IF designed to create this ultimate space, space fleet that people can uh, use to, to control Earth? Is that what this is actually about, almost like a, an Orwellian nightmare? Uh, I was also wondering if um, if perhaps Orson Scott Card was setting up Ender for failure. Uh, we're going to put all this into him, and you have Graf being this militaristic ends justify the mean type, and then in the end he fails Look what you did. You ruined all these children's life, and for what? But then in the end, you don't get any of that. Yeah. So, I mean, um, you can look at it if you want to throw or make some switches out. If you place, you know, uh, look at when it was written uh, in the 80s and, uh, you know, throw in Russians for buggers and, um, or any other country that you'd like. And then you've got, um, you know, pretty good, or pretty good uh, allegory for a lot of stuff that's happened where, <clears throat> we've been attacked now we need to strike back with all the force and crush our enemies and um, that kind of thing. So I think it does speak to a little bit of uh, the military uh, thought process of the time. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and Scott Card specifically states that the civil war was a huge influence as well. And I mean, on top of that, the foundation series and everything along those lines, which also has that kind of underpinning of militarization that's associated with the, the writing. So, uh, yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And also just kind of give some background. Card had envisioned Speaker for the Dead initially and then wrote Ender's Game kind of to set up the character for Speaker for the Dead. And so interestingly enough, that setup. Well, I, I really like description about how anybody can take away what they want from Ender's Game because while Speaker for the Dead and Genocide and Children of the Mind kind of had this very specific tract that you can you all kind of, like everyone kind of follows along while they're reading it, Ender's Game is so expansive and just explodes this entire universe that I mean I, I just think that it, it's maybe the theme maybe one of the themes that is taking away from it the fact that it's so multifaceted and has like the military, the technology, the family, the isolationist perspective of Ender as a kid, everything along those lines. So, yeah, I'm no author, but I don't think Ender's game, um, I don't think Card, when he was writing it, just based on, you know, knowing just, you know, what was discussed a minute ago that Speaker for the Dead was the really the main novel and Ender's game, you know, is a short story at, you know, to set up Speaker for the Dead. I really don't think Card had a specific anything in mind. I think that he was just kind of expanding it. It turned into this, you know, interesting and amazing story along the way, which is why so many people can pick out different themes here and there because it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like he really had a theme. The theme was let's set these characters up so that way the next novel makes sense. Now having read Ender's Game as a standalone at this point in time, I haven't read any of the other books in the series. Um I thought it was sort of interesting. It's a bit of a coming of age story. I mean, it's a kid going to school and developing and growing, but not traditional, maybe traditional sci-fi. But um, I thought it was interesting that Scott Card sort of set up Peter and Val at home as having a bit of a moral argument for the planet. But in the meantime, the military marches on and Ender continues his mission. 
And while there was a little bit of a wrap up at the end of the book, it definitely left me wanting more. Like, well, tell me more about exactly what was going on on the planet. And I think that in the further novels, and I'm sure you all will help me out here, that that's explored a little more deeply. Yeah, it's me. It's more the shadow series that goes into that than the main series. Okay. It definitely is explored more deeply. And I think that a lot of, a lot of when he started with Ender, he, like I said, he was definitely kind of creating this as it goes along. And this doesn't, this was not the foundation story. This was not the story that was going to birth the Ender verse. The speaker of the dead story was, but we needed to get to the rest of these characters somehow. And then as these characters came up, the stories were introduced their backstory is interesting because that story was interesting. We want to know how now these events came about. So it, was, it made it so that way Card was able to expand Ender's game into an Ender verse encompassing all of the characters that you know he set up there. Right, and you really see that come to fruition in the way that he writes the books in the timeline. Like for example, Ender and Ex- Exile, like showing this long journey between Ender's Game and Speak for the Dead, and Scott Card kind of going back and being like, "Oh, I'm gonna like delve into this now." And then like Shadows and Flood is another kind of like side story with being all grown up as the giant and his kids and everything along those lines. So interestingly enough, while it's like fragmented from the beginning, he kind of fills in this overall universe over time, just in a very non-sequential way. Hmm. I think the main point of the whole series and the books are to raise like the philosophical questions that he's kind of thought about, obviously. And um, I guess for Ender's Game, the first one kind of was, the, do the ends justify the means? And that's where, that's where it ended up with me, really. It's just, does everything uh, that happened to Ender matter in the end? And... To Ender, he never feels like what everything that happened should it have really happened, and he doesn't think it should have. And you learn later on why in the other books that he feels that way, which is that the Hive Queens were trying to be peaceful and trying to make t- like communications with them. So really, the answer at the end of the Ender Ender's game is no. Everything mm-hmm. wasn't necessary, and I think the rest of the books are kind of. Uh, that's what Ender lives with, is that all of what he lived with wasn't necessary. And you see a bit of, of foreshadowing of this, or at least leading up to the, the fulcrum point, with Ender in the um, the fantasy game, going into Fairyland. And uh, it's pretty clear that, uh, as we mentioned, that the buggers and the queens were, were tapped into Ender's brain and watching what he was seeing and, and trying to communicate with him as best they could. But the, there were some questions in the middle of the book about where the game was getting some of the data that it had. Is that fleshed out in future books? Yeah, it's explained later on um, that Uh, the Ansible that they discuss um, has these things called philotic connections. And philotic is P-H-I-L-O-T-I-C. And I don't know if that's a real thing. I don't know if that's a real (laughs) word. I don't know if Scott or since Scott Carr just made that up, what that's supposed to be. But he really explains it in detail, and it becomes a major thing. Um, I'm I'm sure another guest here can tell can say which book it is, but it becomes a major thing that communication when a being named Jane comes into view comes into the picture. And and she's a like some sort of supercomputer that communicates. I want to say that might be even in. Speaker, Speaker for, for the, the Dead. dead. Is that in Speaker for the Dead? That's, mm-hmm. that's where Jane first comes in, yeah. And then that's really where the whole theme of communication really starts kicking off. So I yeah. guess Ender's Game kind of sets up the uh, <laughs> the idea of if you can't communicate effectively with the enemy, then that's where problems start arising. And that kind of is a question that carries on throughout the series. Yeah, th- that, that does seem to be a pretty strong theme is the communicating properly to make sure that you're not creating an enemy in your mind, manufacturing an enemy in your mind, being able to communicate with that person, you know, can, yeah. can eliminate an enemy. Yeah, Xenocide or uh, Children of the Mind, even um, with the piggies, um, you know, that same theme come, uh, shows itself again where they can't communicate and don't understand what's going on uh, in this piggy culture. 
uh, and it kind of leads to some confrontation. And I think, you know, it's a recurring theme uh, to some extent as well. So I would say communication is a major theme then, because he also shows Peter and Val taking over the world by blogging. Mm, just through communication. By- in the 80s, which is... By, right. early, by early 80s right, blogging. Right. On, on the net. Right. <laughs> on the net. Plural. Just on the kind net. Of what we do, right? <laughs> on the board. I liked very much Valentine's description of her power versus Peter, uh, Peter's power, where Peter was able to uh, bully people and make them feel bad into doing whatever they wanted to do, whatever he wanted them to do, whereas her power was to... Um, flatter them and make them feel good so that she could manipulate genuinely them. persuade them mm. she was the more you catch more bees with honey and and peter mm. was like burn the hive you know like you know yeah. kind of but she was she was still you know concerned about herself thinking well i'm still just manipulating people is this is this any better than what he's doing just because I do it nicely, is it the right thing to do? Was her question. Exactly. Right. So maybe that's the theme: is manipulation a uh, yeah. a justifiable uh, mode? Yeah. Well, I think um, kind of what they discover, um, Peter and Val do. You know, their work was was pretty necessary because you see kind of the world in turmoil after uh, the buggers are destroyed, and you know if they want to have done it if they went to done what they did and they went to persuade the people regardless of their means of how they did it, um, you know, I think it would have been, their world would have been in a lot more dire of a situation. And so I don't know if they ever kind of explicitly say that it was uh, worth it and then, you know, to themselves, but uh, you know, you definitely see that it, you know, as a reader, it definitely is. I think you you see that theme a lot in literature in general or, or art in general. I mean, I'm thinking of an episode of Deep Space Nine where lies, deceit, and even murder bring about the Romulans entering the war, and without them, the war would have been lost. But we needed to lie and get we needed to lie and do bad things in order to get them involved. So now, where where else in literature do we see this theme? Oh, I imagine now that you're asking, there's probably too many to name. <laughs> but as we're reading next time, as we're coming along them next yeah. time, we'll be able to identify them. Yeah, so um, I think it's I think it's well, kind of... Uh, we talked a little bit about Harry Potter a minute ago. That's a strong manipulation. Mm-hmm. You know, like, spoiler, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, because here comes one. But like with whole Dumbledore leading <laughs> Harry around and becoming... He, how he was the chosen one and towards the end, all the way to the very end, Dumbledore kept that secret that, you know, again, spoiler alert, that Harry's going to mm-hmm. die. That in order t- for this to be done, mm-hmm. Harry needs to die, but we can't tell him. Mm-hmm. Like right. there was that whole manipulation and drawing mm-hmm. drawing Snape out to play both sides, making sure Harry gets all of those hallows and dies at the end. That's, you know, manipulation on his part is a pretty strong theme in, in the Harry Potter novels. Mm-hmm. And I would say that's a pretty strong parallel to Graf and Ender. Mm-hmm. True. True. And I, I saw- we need you to do this, but we're not going to tell you that you're destroy- You're committing genocide. Okay. Mm-hmm. I've got a good one for manipulation. Uh, is anybody here a fan of Ian Banks? I've heard of him. Uh, his, his, the second book in his culture series, The Player of Games. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, ma- the main character is... Well, like the title implies, a guy who plays games mm-hmm. and why he doesn't need to have a career or aspirations or etc. is just kind of a byproduct of this perfect utopian world that they live in. But uh, he's he's basically the best there is, like generally. Like there are people who say are better at poker because all they play is poker, but he plays everything and is just excellent at absolutely everything and he you know predictably after years and years and years of this he's bored as all get out so the government comes to him and says hey we found this new game that you've never heard of before on this faraway planet they're kind of backwards they're kind of barbaric but the game is so complicated it's so in depth so strategically just insane it's kind of right up your alley we think you'd like it so they send him for like the game is such a big deal to this culture that whoever wins this tournament every four years or so becomes the emperor of this entire species. And he, you know, this intrigues him predictably. And he, well, for reasons I won't get into, he gets blackmailed into going basically. And he plays this game. He practices nonstop for the two year journey till he gets there. 
and gets really adept at it and enters this tournament just you know he's not even if he wins the whole thing he can't become emperor because he's not of their species blah 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 he gets this to this other society and he starts playing this game in this tournament and they're all you know he it's a lark to them he's the outsider they treat him all nice because they think it's funny that he wants to play this game that they all spend their like it, it's it's like playing soccer to Mexican kids. It's their life from the time they're able to form memories. But he starts winning. He starts beating all of these high ranking, you know, well regarded players. So he gets to a certain point and he cuts a deal with the government that uh, he's kind of going to. And Samantha, I'm sorry if you want to read this. You might want to mute me no, or something because okay. I'm going to wreck the end of this. <laughs> this is okay. our spoiler I'm alert. Spoiler. Yeah, here's the spoil- spoiler spoiler okay. alert. Uh, he he gets all the way to the final round to play with the acting emperor of this of the species, and he gets whooped in the first round, and then kind of slowly starts to come back until it becomes apparent that the emperor cannot beat him he is guaranteed to win this whole thing and then the emperor starts trying to kill him so his culture comes in kills the emperor kills all of the government and basically just takes over and they tell him yeah we've been wanting to do this for years but we didn't have a good enough reason so we (laughs) figured you know you were the one that could get to this point and kind of trigger the whole powder keg Wow. So thanks. You were really good at that game, though. Good job, buddy. Yeah. That's like <laughs> legit manipulation right there. That's from start to finish. Yeah, that, that is Peter yeah. Wigan level manipulation. No, no kidding. kidding. Excellent yeah. book. Highly recommended. Huh. Yeah, it Even though good. I just recited the whole thing for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Throwing another one out there, the, the Percy Jackson series also has a strong theme of manipulation throughout every book. One book is completely and totally, they even say it, we're just being manipulated by the gods at this point. Is this even worth doing? Is mm-hmm. this really, you know, or is this really what it seems? Is this even real? Is this really happening? And both sides begin to play humans, get in their heads and start trying to go back and forth with each other. Then uh, it's just gods playing with the, the lowly peons. It's, you know, the gods and the titans playing with the creations that... That are we mortals to fight their battles for them here on Earth. So I feel like that swings back to one of my questions when I read Ender's Game. We have Ender fighting this entire battle to save Earth, but the Earth that he's saving is basically built into... And again, I haven't read the other books in the series, but it seems like it's built into a breeding ground for a military complex. Like... Everybody has their allotted two children, and then if your two children were good enough to beat our formula, then we want you to have a third child, because maybe that child is going to be good enough to win this war. What are the ends in this case? What are you trying to save? And if it weren't for Peter and Val Valentine, you know, sort of easing that transition after the third invasion, really, I don't know. Well, fighting broke out as soon as the battle was over. Right. Right. That's what I mean. That's uh, yeah. the Shadow series really gets into that. And I think, like, we see. Mm-hmm. So, for those of you who haven't read it, I mean, political turmoil just like erupts as soon as the buggers are no longer in existence. Because if you think from, and this is maybe another theme of the book, a unification for of the human race across for the common globe, enemy. right, only occurs because of the fact that we have a common enemy, and right. so. The, and when, when you see shadow puppets where they all kind of get fragmented again and everyone goes back to their countries that they're associated with and then talk about manipulation being embedded into it, all the major military powers, uh, each one of their countries, are now trying to manipulate the intelligent kids from command school and battle, battle school that have now gone back to their subsequent countries. Yeah, they're, so. they're all prizes that get taken home. And, and you know, just, just as stated a minute ago, when all the, all the countries begin going back to their little squabbles once the united once the you know being united against the common enemy goes away that common enemy is gone well now let's go back to the discussion we were having russia get rid of your warheads the u.s needs to cut, right. cut down on this or that we all yeah. go right to where we were a minute ago you know that that kind of, that makes me think of an interesting parallel to Watchmen. Uh, they, it's that's kind of how it is at the end. The world is i mean the whole book the world is on the brink of nuclear war 
And then this one character uh, named Adrian Veidt, a superhero called Ozymandias, uh, basically tricks one of the other characters into doing a bad thing that obviously only he could have done to make the whole world be like, oh, this omnipotent, all-knowing being is clearly our enemy. Let's focus on him as a deterrent for nuclear war, because otherwise we were just going to bomb ourselves into oblivion. Aptly named Dr. Manhattan. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So I'll, um, I'll try and bring us back to the starting point and also bring us up. We're coming up on uh, close to an hour now. So if anybody has any final thoughts or if anybody has any big significant ideas that they think we missed, I'd like to invite you to mention those now. One one interesting thing uh, I found from the whole series, I don't know where it gets brought up, it may be just at the end of Ender's Game, but um, with in regards to Peter, he uh, is always seen as like this terrible person and whatnot, but then he realizes that to get anywhere in life, he has to be like a better person, so he kind of puts on an act for a long time, <laughs> and eventually... He, it's like uh, the line gets blurred between where he's acting and where he's actually himself. And at the when he dies, Ender asks, "What's if you act like a good person your entire life? Are you really a good person?" And were you pretending to be a good person, or are you actually a good person? And can we tell the difference between the two? Yeah, but I mean, no matter what his, uh, no matter what his motivations or intentions where he did end up doing a tremendous amount of good as a politician. So even if he's a sociopath on the inside, mm -hmm. if he did a lot for the species in a positive light, I mean, was he really that bad? Hmm. Well, that comes back to the ends justifying the means. Yeah. I think yeah. that yeah. comes back to like real life politics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which and, you should probably leave out of this. However. <laughs> yeah. So I guess um, something that, I think we may have missed on is that, uh, and a spoiler for later books, is that uh, Ender is able to restart the uh, formic race and formic species. So I think, you know, even though he knows he did something, you know, extremely horrible that's never been done, and uh, obviously it torments him throughout the rest of his life, uh, <clears throat> there is still one final act that he does when he restores them that kind of brings him to peace with himself, his actions, and you know, kind of makes him realize that he wasn't as smart as he thought he was when he was doing all these things because he got played, essentially. He got manipulated into doing it. And I think that last act of selflessness eases his mind and, you know, kind of shows that even though you may have done a bunch of bad things, you may have felt that, you know, your life was not yours, that you can still salvage, uh, salvage it if you want. Uh, also, maybe a separate kind of larger thematic point that we didn't really touch on is kind of the underpinning of how much religion influenced these books and maybe not so much Anders game, but speaker for the dead and genocide for sure. I mean, they kind of delve into new characters that are extremely religious. And I thought it was interesting kind of how you have Anders game, which is extremely like sci-fi and doesn't have that religious underpinning to it. And then speaker for the dead kind of gets into that and you see cards own ideologies being factored in as well so it's just like kind of a larger thematic point to keep in mind yeah uh, children of the mind was uh, right to that point yeah definitely i think out of the all of the ender books you know the, the enderverse books children of the mind for me was that one that brought the religious theme to because i mean i know it's there but it just wasn't something that i really noticed or actively paid attention to until children of the mind came along and when i went back and reread ender and a few of the other ones not so much ender where you catch it but in the overall ender verse you really start to see you know that that really that slight take on on religious themes coming into play here and there right. um, oh yeah mm -hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. so i quickly jumped onto goodreads today um to look at ender's game and i was shocked at the number of people who didn't like the book. I mean, that's kind of... Those were the movie the, watchers. Well, that that <laughs> and it's incredibly well-known. It's award-winning. It's super popular. It's going to have an anti-circle jerk. You know? Yeah, I suppose that's true. Yeah. By, by the two, two edgy for me teens and whatnot. I mm. suppose that's true. There was a lot of talk of it being um, anti-feminist, which 
I suppose, but I feel like you also have to factor in when it was written. Like the most badass character in the book is a girl. What the hell? <laughs> Petra, yeah. Petra and Valentine too. Right. Yeah, right. and then also when they it has those pinnings, but it's not like they're meaning it. I do have to though. If you if you're going to bring up feminism, I have to bring up Graf's quote. We have a few girls. He's talking about Battle School here. When when this was just specifically in. quoted. Yeah. Um. <laughs> we have a few girls. They don't often pass the test to, to get in. Too many centuries of evolution working against them. So my question is: Is that a sexist statement? And is the test objective? The test is not objective, but I don't think that's a sexist statement. Sometimes the truth is the truth, and in their world, that's the way genetics ran and in and cards universe that's <laughs> and in his mind i think that that's mm-hmm. the way it is and that's just mm. a simple truth of the test but that doesn't mean that the test is an objective test i like being able to put that filter on it like well in that world it's true mm. in that world it, that's mm. yeah that's how i feel and and you know we're not I breeding know. kids for military service yet so you're good okay yeah, yeah i'm well, haters not, not this back up <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. is a- right 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 <laughs> but they <laughs> But they did kind of make some adjustments for that in the movie. We have a few extra female characters, and I think we see some additional race in the characters. Of course, the um, uh, stereotypes and the, the the racism against Jews and a few other um, races was kind of eliminated that or glossed over. Uh, did you guys notice that? Do you have any th- opinions about that regarding the movie? I think so a lot one of those important themes were glossed over in the movie, so that way Card's battle room could come to fruition. I really <laughs> think a lot of the important points were missed. <laughs> <laughs> because we could so know that smartly. Then, <laughs> yeah, I think the movie exactly would have been much better done uh, as like an HBO series or a Netflix yep. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the whole series would be a great mm-hmm. series of yeah. Yeah. video. You could split that. You could split that one book into a whole season if you wanted to, and do every book. That's my. Mm-hmm. That's why I think it should be done. Mm-hmm. Right. The, guy, the guys, the guys yeah, from that. Penny Arcade uh, mentioned that in in one of their strips. Like, uh, well, I mean, there there are teens on a space station. Why isn't this shit on the CW or something? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe it's all the genocide. Maybe yeah, it could have something yeah. to do with all the wars, yeah. the genocide, and you know, the beating up children and all that. Uh. <laughs> Just cast them older, then you can have some romance going on too. It's fine. Yeah, like exactly what Card did not exactly, want to have happen. Exactly. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm 27. I could I could play Ender. Right. right? Sure. Yeah. I don't know how. No, I think it depends on how the, uh... the lack of a the lack of a love story in the book is probably something you you don't see a lot today. Um, at least not between individual protagonists. Maybe between yeah. you know Ender and Ender and the uh, Formics. But um, you know uh, everything. The very thing the book is, it definitely isn't a love story. Mm-hmm. Of, of course, let's keep let's keep in mind that for the well, really the entirety of the book, because the Formic War ends when Ender's twelve, right? Uh, like that. So for, yes. for the entirety of the book, he's still in that "you girls are icky" phase. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't even think he got an opportunity to get to that "you girls are icky" phase. <laughs> no, no, no. I have a specific I don't think note that about it at all. Yeah. Ender saves the world when he's ten years old. So yeah, that's. Definitely before, and, and they kind of bring that, bring some of it up here and there. Um, the whole girls thing, girls and boys being in, in shared quarters when discussing undressing, because the boys, you know, run around, they undress, they run around naked, they get their suits on, they go. But it's discussed. You don't do that in front of Petra, right? You know? bon- Bonso specifically forbids it, and Ender thinks, "Well, that's ridiculous. We're six years old. We all look the same." Uh, yeah. well, I think uh, I think even Petra was the one that was naked when they first in, met yeah. as well in the book. Yeah. Oh, and what one last thing, uh, Samantha? Some, a question you asked a long time ago. Uh, phylotic physics is not a real thing. It was created by Orson Scott Card. <laughs> That is important. It ties a lot to quantum physics, but not exactly connected. <laughs> and then you talk to the string theorists. Now yeah. I know. See, I would have walked around walking into my next philotic science meeting thinking that I would have known, was knowing what I was talking about, and they would have kicked me out and sent me to the curb. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on how good you can bluff, really, I think. Okay, so uh, to to wrap up, what we like to do is give everybody a brief moment where they can talk about anything that they like, uh, other books that you'd recommend, or what you think the podcast ought to do next, any final thoughts you may have. We'll go ahead and start with Warren. Uh, I'll take like five seconds and just say literally anything by Brandon Sanderson. Mm. Okay, Nick, how about you? 
uh, I'd say anything in the Ender's Game series, hopefully continue on the Ender's Game series, read <laughs> Speaker and Xenocide and mm-hmm. Children of the Mind, because that's, uh, that's where the real meat of the story is. Okay. Andrew? Yeah, I'd say the Expanse series. I mean, I know it's gotten a lot of uh, applause for the show, but really the books are an incredible read, so just get into them. They're great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Samantha? I think we discussed it a little bit here and there, kind of touched on it as as being a a good one, but definitely I would explore the Foundation series. A few of the books in there have a lot of meat in there that can be dissected and discussed, and I'm I'm a sci-fi fan, you know, but I've I've read a lot here and there, but I think that that would be a really good one to analyze and have a discussion about, is really almost any book in the Foundation series. Hmm. Uh, You know, Asimov is a, a brilliant writer. He gives a lot of food for thought that you know, I think would foster a great conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Ian? Uh, yeah, definitely the rest of the Ender's Game series, the Shadow series, um, the Earth series is all great, and I suggest reading them in the order that they were released. Uh, I think it's uh, interesting insights and uh, information back and forth. It's a lot to keep track of, but it's definitely uh, like the best way to read it. Mm-hmm. Can I throw one yeah, more? Agreed. Please do. I would also, this is going to come way out of left field, but it just popped into my head for a good discussion. Try Flowers in the Attic by V.C. Andrews. That's, <laughs> that's a good discussion. That's let's, been a let's, while. Let's okay, open I'd like to reread that as an adult. That weird box. Let's go there and open up that weird <laughs> box. Right. Oh, it, I would love to hear you react it, to that. If we're too. going for the okay. weird box, if we're going for the weird box, I'll throw out House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski. Oh, that's a yes. good box. <laughs> House of Leaves was awesome. Yeah, oh, it's a uh, hitchhiker's guide, but there that is the definition of a rabbit hole. A mm-hmm. yeah. No. yeah, that that was the most unique book I've read in a long time. Yeah, that, that one got recommended to me that if you like this, then try that. And I was like, what is it that I like that would have brought that up? <laughs> <laughs> I um I'm going to throw out Ender's Game put me in mind of the Babylon Five universe. So I think you should watch a show because mm. we do a lot of reading. Yeah, <laughs> just kidding. We should read more. But I don't know. There was a. I think J. Michael Straczynski probably read Ender's Game before he wrote that. Um, yeah, that's my final what? thought. And I finished, um, and then there were none by Agatha Christie about an hour ago. Ooh. And I really do like her books. <laughs> so, but that has nothing to do with sci-fi or Ender's Game. Or anything. Well, that's all right. This is a novel podcast, not a sci-fi <laughs> novel. Podcast. Right. So that was my novel that I read today. In, okay. Or finished today. Uh, I'm reading Cabal by uh, Clive Barker, and uh, it's definitely interesting. It's not quite House of Leaves um, unique, but it is quite interesting. Uh, of course, we're going to be doing Devil in the White City for our next episode. If any of you guys have read that and would care to join us, you're welcome to. I uh, highly recommend that one. And then... Um, Oh, we're going to read Mary Roach. We are going to read some Mary Roach shortly thereafter. That's my favorite nonfiction author. Oh, I remember now. The other thing was, uh, as far as Asimov goes, I have never read Foundation, but uh, uh, it's gonna—it's on my list. It's just I'm going to get there eventually. But I have read um, Caves of Steel, Naked Sun, uh, and the uh, third one, the name of which escapes me, uh, highly recommended um, the Elijah Bailey and the murder mystery detective novels by Asimov. All right, so with that, thank you all very much for joining us, and have a nice evening. A Novel Podcast is looking to produce more episodes, and we want you to join us. If you like reading novels and then talking about them, then you're a perfect candidate. We record remotely, so your location on Earth isn't a consideration, and no prior experience is necessary. Send us an email or a tweet, and let us know what books you'd like to discuss. A novel podcast at gmail.com or at a novel podcast. Look forward to hearing from you.